Hello everybody, Jake Raby here, Flat 6 Innovations, back with you for another RenVision technical video. Now in this video, we're going to talk about the symptoms of bore scoring. And I want to tell you that we've actually went through and revised all of our videos that were originally recorded in the 2018-2019 period, pre-pandemic if you will, and we're bringing that back up to speed for mid-2021, post-pandemic. And during that period, we've learned a lot more about bore scoring, primarily because we've gotten even busier with bore scoring cases and is about the only kind of failure we're accepting here at Flat 6 Innovations. So we want to make sure everybody is still up to speed when it comes to what the symptoms of bore scoring are. So as you continue to watch our video, understand that everything that you see here in this video today is what we are currently seeing at Flat 6 Innovations. We want to help you help yourself, so it's very important that we make sure your information is up to date. So this is the video you want to watch if you have weird ticking sounds. Sometimes they only happen when the engine's cold. Sometimes they only happen when the engine's hot. Sometimes they happen all the time. Sometimes they get louder with certain engine temperatures. It's also the video you want to watch if you've got one tailpipe that's more dirty than the other. If you've got smoke at startup. If you have oil consumption. If you've noticed a spike in your oil consumption, these are the things that you want to watch. And we've revised our content for 2021 in this particular video and the rest of the Focus on Bore Scoring series to make sure that we're telling you everything that we continue to see and make sure that this information is fresh and correct. Okay? So now, one thing I do want to go over with you is about how long it takes to go from asymptomatic bore scoring to symptomatic bore scoring based on what we're seeing. So these videos, while they're considered fear-mongering by those who are the opposition and do not want to believe in facts and factual information that has been acquired through very in-depth analytical type of evaluations, basically this is all factual information that we've learned from first-hand direct experience. We see more bore scoring than anybody else in North America. And this particular ailment is what is bringing us 92% of our engine work as of mid-2021. One reason for that is it's because what I'm selecting. This is a failure that we love because we can give you absolute prices. We can give you an absolute known result. We know exactly how to handle this, and it's gravy work for us. We're going to take that over a failed engine that's blown into a thousand pieces any day of the week. It makes it easy for us to do an exemplary job of what we do. So 92% of the engines we built in 2020 and now into 2021, 90% have been due to bore scoring. Some of those had symptoms. Some of those did not have symptoms. Okay. Sometimes we would do an elective job and the customer wouldn't think he had bore scoring. We get the engine in and we find out it was scoring the bores did not have any symptoms, okay? So we're doing a lot of elective work, but it's only about 10% because so much of it is being made up by non-elective failure work from cylinder bore scoring. So people always ask me, you know, I've got these symptoms, how long is the engine gonna last, okay? Well, part seven of the focus on bore scoring is about living with bore scoring. You wanna watch all these videos, but if you have bore scoring, you want to watch that one in particular because it will tell you the things that you need to do based on my experience and the experience of LN engineering, total seal piston rings, to help you get the most amount of time out of the engine with its ailment, okay? So during the processes of doing our engine work, we currently have about an 18 month backlog. That's from the time we start a project to a completion date, okay? And we've not been late with any jobs, even though everything else in life has been late during the pandemic, we haven't been late. 
We've actually been right on time. And I'll knock on wood for that, right? But at the end of the day, having all this extra analytical time and seeing so many more bore scoring cases with customers driving the car still, we're able to learn in about a 14 month period a lot more about bore scoring than we had before because we're creating case studies, okay? So a good example, I had a customer from Pennsylvania. He had a uh, later model Cayman, a 2008 I believe it was. It was an 06 to an 08, not really sure exactly what year. That's an M9721 engine, one of the engines that has a confirmed bore scoring ailment. It's one of the engine designations we know has bore scoring problems. He had a elective type bore scope work done to the car and the certified installer that was working with that engine found that he had bore scoring. Had no symptoms at all. This guy had watched videos, he wanted to make sure he did not have it, and he did have it. He immediately came to us said, I love the car, that's a key, and I want to keep the car, that's a key. And the third one is, I know it's going to take a long time and I know it's going to cost a lot of money, okay? But he was good with all that, and he knew he was going to have a problem. So he started my process, got the welcome package, got the proposal, paid his admission fee, got in the schedule, and we were going to collect his car 14 months after that for a completion about 17 months after that. So we collect the car and have it for roughly three to four months to do our work to your engine. This is not an engine swap process. If you give us this block, we give you this block back. Okay, so he had no symptoms. We only had a visual inspection with a bore scope performed and he drove that car under the directions that I set forth in part seven of the bore scoring series using the, the particular oil that we talk about, changing the oil about every 2,500 to 3,000 miles. And he was able to drive that car 10,000 miles before he had any symptoms. His symptoms only showed up about three weeks before he shipped us that car 14 months into our process. We got it and we've documented it and we'll show you some of those things that we were able to, to share or at least pick up from the shop that did the work as well as our teardown pictures because we've got both. When they found the bore scoring that was asymptomatic all the way through to us tearing down the engine, we saw how much it had progressed, okay? Critical information, but we've done that with several of these case studies. So he was able to go 10,000 miles. We had another customer that went 8,000 miles. We had another one that went about 6,000 miles. We've had a lot of them that go through that entire roughly 14 month period while they're waiting to ship us their car that still do not have any symptoms. They have visual confirmed, very conclusive bore scoring with the bore scope going from the sump and the spark plug hole both, but they don't end up with any symptoms. A lot of those guys, we're not driving the cars enough during the pandemic, and that's why they did not have the symptoms. It'll be about a 10,000 mile period from the time you are asymptomatic to the time you show a symptom if you're doing all the things right that we set forth in that part seven. And of course, we have no problem giving you some direction outside of that, obviously while you're in our queue and you've paid your price of admission, okay? So with no further ado, let's get into the symptoms of bore scoring from 2019. Hi, I'm Charles Navarro from Allen Engineering. I'm Lake Speed Jr. from Driven Racing Oil. We get lots of phone calls and emails about cylinder bore scoring. One of the best tools you can use, other than doing preventative maintenance and using a good oil, is also adding used oil analysis to your regimen. What we have here, I'd like to try to explain what's happening and how you can use used oil analysis to try to catch this bore scoring issue before it becomes catastrophic. So what you can see here, there's a ferro stand coating on the skirt of the piston. It's an iron coating. And what has happened here, the coating has failed. And when that happens, you get aluminum to aluminum contact. And on this block here, which the piston came from, you can see cylinder bore scoring. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Lake so he can show you what a used oil analysis looks like for a motor that we have confirmed has cylinder bore scoring as a failure. 
Thanks, Charles. As Charles alluded, the piston's aluminum. The ferrous stand is a ferrous coating. And what you see here in this used oil analysis is that the original samples had very low levels of aluminum, around three and four parts per million, which is a nice level. Then all of a sudden, in this last sample, it goes from three to 30. That's a significant change. And not only did the aluminum increase, the silicon increased from two to 11. So that's a significant change. And the key thing is, because it's aluminum and silicon, guess what's aluminum and silicon? The bore material is. So what's happening is the bore is wearing, transferring to the piston, just like Charles said, and it's showing up in the used oil analysis. So before the engine ever gives you any audible or visible signs there's a problem, the used oil analysis is letting you know there's already a problem. In this case, it's going to be catastrophic. The conclusions that were drawn indicated there probably is a problem, but lack of Porsche-specific knowledge did not lead them to tell the owner of this vehicle that he had cylinder scoring. When I first saw this report, I knew right away this motor had bore scoring, which was backed up by the fact that this engine was pulled apart and one piston and cylinder was indeed scored. The whole goal of used oil analysis is to reduce, or to mitigate at least, the collateral damage that might occur in a situation like this. These guys got you pretty close, but they stopped short of saying, hey, you got a serious problem. And that's the whole idea behind speed diagnostics and the partnership with Ellen Engineering is to give you that certainty that you can know for certain you've got a problem and it's time to take corrective action in order to mitigate any collateral damage. If you want to know more about bore scoring, click on the link below. There's a whole video series that Jake Raby has done that gives you the deep dive into this. So we're going to talk about the first symptom. Usually it's the most prominent, not in all cases. It is the noise. That noise is the, the absolute best symptom to help differentiate bore scoring from any other failure. A lot of times an engine will come to us, people say, it runs perfect. It has no symptoms. You know, maybe it burns some oil, it runs perfect, it doesn't make any other, has no other problems, but it has the noise. Now what I have here is a piston from an M9603 engine. This is an engine that we come out of, let's say, an 02 up to an 05 996, an early 997 even, uh, that had an M9605 engine designation. So this piston is very similar between those two designations. As you can see here, it actually has a failure of the ferrostan coating on the piston. Now we've talked about that in some of the other videos. If you're just joining us, you might want to go back and watch the segments in the series before this one to get a better idea of what the ferro stand is. It goes all the way back to segment one in our bore scoring series. So as you can see here on this side, other than this one little spot, the ferro stand coating is still in place. This side, the ferro stand is basically gone. Now when this ferro stand starts to go away, it has a thickness and it measures to be about two thousandths of an inch thick according to where it flakes off of the piston. I've taken a micrometer, I've measured it before. I know exactly what ferrous stand looks like when you find it in engine oil and the oil filter. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on because you can actually find this in the oil sump during an evaluation. So as this coating starts to flake off, this actually increases the cylinder to piston clearance. That is the difference between the inside diameter of the cylinder, as you see here, and the outside diameter of the piston. Now, the ferrous stand coating always fails at the largest portion of the piston. As you can see over here on the side, no wear. Over here on this side, no wear. In the middle, which is actually the contact patch that is by design where it's supposed to be the widest portion, that's where the ferrous stand starts to fail first. So when it fails here, a lot of times 
you'll pick up a noise. And I'm going to try to mimic that. And a lot of times people confuse this with a lifter. I can't say this enough. These engines do not have lifter problems. They are, every now and then you'll have one fluke that is a lifter issue. But lifter noises really do not happen to these engines. We see engines have misfires and have other symptoms that are very notable and never make a lifter noise. It's almost like the lifters that make noise aren't bad. So if you hear a noise, you must consider it is a cylinder. I will say that many times over. If you hear this noise, you must consider it's a cylinder. You go to that first. You don't presume it's a lifter. So this noise, I'm trying to mimic it here a little bit as I rock the piston in the bore. Okay, that noise is what you hear amplified times several hundred percent because it's in an operating engine that not only has the piston, but it has a connecting rod. Now with this one, you see the ferro stand's completely gone, okay? So with this one, I'm gonna stick it in the bore and we'll see what this one sounds like. So kind of a, a rough sample of it there, but you get the idea, cylinder and piston clearance, add the connecting rod, add operation, add combustion, and that's what creates the noise, okay? So the noise to me is the absolute most critical symptom that we can associate with bore scoring. So the noise a lot of times is confused with the lifter simply because it has almost the exact same rhythm and tone as a lifter that's noisy or a lifter that's not pumped up, okay? So this is why people go directly to that. I've made the mistake as well. 15, 18 years ago, when we were new to these engines, it was the exact same thing here. I made a wrong call. I did a lifter job on an engine. It was losing a cylinder and I had to eat it. At that point in time, I learned a valuable lesson that a lot of people have not been exposed to yet, even professionals that work specifically with Porsche engines. So the reason why this sounds like a lifter and has the same rhythm and tone and is so confusingly similar is because as your piston, of course, travels from top dead center of the cylinder and it travels down to bottom dead center, it goes through changeover when it gets to the bottom. So as your connecting rod, okay, has come all the way down, and it starts to move over and come back up, this is changeover. So as the connecting rod moves around and it changes over from downward motion, it has a dwell time, and then it goes to an upward motion, the piston has a tendency to rock. So it comes down one direction, as the piston comes around, as the rod comes around, it changes direction, there's a tick, it comes up, straightens up, stops, has a dwell time there, ticks, goes back down. So what you're hearing is tick, 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 tick. That's why it has the exact same rhythm and tone as a lifter. And that's why it responds to other tests like revving the engine up, holding it at a certain RPM, decelerating it. It will sound exactly like a lifter almost 100% of the time. And the reason why is because of the, the characteristics that the piston goes through as it travels the length of the bore. So now we're gonna talk about the sooty or dirty tailpipe. And you can have sooty or dirty tailpipes in plural. Um, some cars only have one dirty tailpipe, others will have them equally just as dirty. A lot of people confuse that with oil consumption. But I want to make it very clear that the soot that you see is unburned fuel. That unburned fuel will mix with partially burned oil and it makes the soot. So we see this as a characteristic of engines suffering from bore scoring and we see it more of a precursor. So a lot of times we've caught engines that came to us, we had a lot of soot in one tailpipe, we end up doing an injector job, a fuel pump job, a fuel pressure regulator job. You know, we clean the injectors really well, clean the fuel system really well. We are able to stabilize the fuel trim values. A lot of times it means we have to put the car on the dyno and beat it kind of hard sometimes to get all the chamber contamination and all the dirty stuff out of it. 
Sometimes we see that those dirty tailpipes come from O2 sensors that are going bad and giving some, some weird voltages. Catalytic converters going bad. Secondary air systems that are going bad. All of these things, even vacuum leaks, can play into this. Um, you know, even an air wall separator going bad will affect the engine's enrichment. So if you see a dirty tailpipe, you must take that seriously from a bore scoring perspective because a lot of cases come in with one or both dirty tailpipes. And again, people think that it's because the engine is consuming oil. Really, it's because the engine is consuming excess fuel. That doesn't mean you're going to get fuel, poor fuel economy because you really might not. You know, you, you may not ever see it in fuel economy, but when you look at fuel trim values, when you look at a, a crankcase manometer reading where we look at the inches of water column of negative pressure in the crankcase, all of these things help us determine why we have that dirty tailpipe. So another common problem with bore score engines is a sooty tailpipe. Oil consumption is another one of the key symptoms associated directly with bore scoring. Now, other things can make an engine consume oil. So it can be a confusingly kind of similar type of, of problem if you have an air oil separator going bad. Let's say you had a, a crankcase vacuum leak and that was making the engine go rich. That would lead to those sooty tailpipes we've talked about, but that will also lead to fuel and oil consumption, okay? So when you start seeing a spike in oil consumption is when you should start to pay attention. So the one thing that I want to tell you is I don't like to run these engines at the very tip top of the oil level. I like to keep them right in the middle of the gauge because if you have them right at the very tip top, it's very easy to overfill the engine with oil. And it's very easy if you go to top it off to then overfill it. So all of my engine customers, to them, and to me, my top level is considered the center of your gauge. The center of the indicator in the electronic gauge or the center of the dipstick on the manual dipstick cars. That's where I like to keep the oil, okay? So let's talk about how to judge consumption. How much engine oil should an engine use? That's a blanket statement. I can't tell you how much an engine is supposed to use. I will say that Porsche has released advanced technical directives that say up to one liter of oil every 660 miles, I believe it is, or one liter every 620 miles is acceptable. It's a big wide spectrum and who knows why they set it at that point, but that is the advanced technical directive. I will tell you some engines will burn pretty much no oil over a 5,000 mile period and that's normal for them. Some engines burn a quart every thousand miles. Like when we build an engine, we alter ring tensions, we alter cylinder technology, and sometimes we end up with a little bit more consumption than a street engine because we're using open clearances. That's how we keep our engines alive on the track. We open up the clearances, we use a proper oil viscosity to work with that. So there's no general blanket statement about how much oil an engine should use. But what you're looking for is a spike or a change in the consumption of your particular engine's oil. So every six months or 5,000 miles, you should be performing an oil service, no matter what the owner's manual may tell you. If you're one of my customers, every six months or 5,000 miles, whichever comes first, I don't care if you drove the car 200 miles, in six months, you're still gonna change the oil. That's just me, that's what I mandate because that's what we believe in and what we see. Now, with that being said, the longer the engine oil is put into service, the more contaminants it soaks up and the easier it's going to be for that oil to lose viscosity, usually through thermal breakdown or through fuel intrusion that helps to cut the oil, kind of like what paint thinner does to paint. That will make the engine oil consume at a greater rate. Pretty much what you're looking for is the consumption per thousand miles driven. So you can't start worrying about bore scoring and drive a couple of hundred miles and top the oil off. You can't keep topping the oil off and ever learn anything about it. So when we do a study on oil consumption, that consumption study is done per thousand miles driven. So we put the engine oil level dead in the middle of the electronic gauge with a vehicle after setting overnight, shut off on a level surface with cold oil. We will then make sure that the oil level is directly in the center of the gauge. The car is then driven normally for a thousand miles. 
you don't add any oil to the engine until it has gotten to the very bottom of your indicator. So we started out in the very center of the indicator. Now we're going to go to the very bottom of the indicator. At that time, add in one half of one quart of oil. That will bring you right back up to the middle, pretty close to where you were before. Then what you basically do is you drive the car until it needs oil again. And when it needs oil again, it'll be at the bottom of the indicator. Do not add oil until the level gets to the bottom of the indicator. Also, do not check the oil. And I will say this again, do not check the oil unless the car has not been driven for at least 12 hours and the car has sat on a completely level surface. You will end up getting a false positive, okay? So the oil is still in the engine, it's just elsewhere and has not populated back down to the engine oil sump where it can be sampled. These are critical things. So as these engines start to consume oil, one thing a lot of people do is they get hypersensitive and they'll start adding oil all the time because mentally they can't believe this is happening. And then they add oil, they end up overfilling the oil. Then that creates more oil consumption and creates more problems. It can actually create an engine failure if you put too much engine oil in the engine. So if you follow the regimen that I'm telling you, only check the engine oil when it's cold after setting overnight only add oil at the same time if it needs it, and only add oil when it's at the very bottom of the indicator. Now, let's remember that the indicator is roughly about one quart from the very tip top to the very bottom. So, you know, if you end up at the very bottom, the engine is not out of oil, okay? It is only one quart roughly low on oil. No big deal. The engine is designed to work in that safe operating range. That is still a safe operating range, okay? So this is something to consider. I would much rather you run on the lower end of that safe operating range as to be hypersensitive, put too much engine oil in, and then start to consume that engine oil and give yourself a false positive. So in closing, the oil consumption study is a 1,000 miles driven study where you will note how much oil is consumed after following my procedure over that 1,000 miles driven. So let's just say at 500 miles, you notice that your indicator has moved from the center down to the bottom. After the car set overnight on a level surface, you're gonna decide, hey, I've gotta put one half of one quart of oil in the car. You go do that, write that down. One half of one quart at 500 miles. Then you go ahead and drive your next 500 miles. At the end of it, let's just say, hey, now the engine is back at the lower mark on the indicator. It's at the very bottom of the safe operating range. I've got to add more oil. Now I've added another half of one quart, and that's put us right back to the center of the range. And we've driven 1,000 miles. So the oil consumption for our engine would be one quart of oil per 1,000 miles driven. So the reason for the oil consumption study is to create trend data so you'll be able to continue to look at this consumption over time to see if you have any spikes in consumption. So let's just say that you had the one quart per thousand miles driven. That's probably a pretty average number for most of the cars that are on the road today. Don't take that as being average for your car. I'm just saying I probably hear the one quart per thousand miles is about the most prominent number I hear. So let's say you're at that number and all of a sudden you notice, hey, I'm only driving 600 miles before I have to put in one half of one quart of oil. You know, maybe now I'm only driving 300 miles before I have to do that. And when you see that spike go up, you have to start looking at things. Then start considering the other symptoms we're talking about in this video. Start looking at the condition of your tailpipe. Start listening for sounds. You don't want to be hypersensitive about it, but you do want to remain vigilant because you've got to stay aware of this. And a lot of times if you can catch it very early on, you can apply some preventative measures to help keep it from getting worse. So extremely black engine oil is another contributing factor to this, really another symptom of it. And a lot of times people expect it to be a little black, but when we see these engines come in that have bore scoring, the problem is that the engine is not, it has no cylinder seal. As the piston starts to wear like this one has, the piston rings start to suffer, the bore starts to suffer, and nothing seals up anymore. So as oil comes by from the crankcase up past the piston rings and gets into the combustion chamber where it is burned, the hydrocarbons, the, the byproducts of the combustion also pass the rings. 
and that's where you get a lot of carbon, and that's what Charles and Lake were talking about in the video prior to this one on used oil analysis. So if you see that extremely black engine oil, or if the oil smells like fuel, a lot of times you have the, ch the combustion chamber contamination passing by the piston rings, passing by the scored bore, getting into the oil, thus contaminating the oil. So extremely black engine oil is always a good indicator of poor ring seal and cylinder bore scoring. So cylinder misfires logged as diagnostic trouble codes, DTCs. Okay. Basically, that's your check engine light is pretty much what that is. So if you're ever driving your car and you see a flashing check engine light that does not stay illuminated, that flashing in check engine light is an indicator that you have individual cylinder misfires that are damaging to the catalytic converter, basically meaning that you have things happening at the wrong time, the cylinder is misfiring, and you're sending a shock wave of combustion down the exhaust pipe where it can damage the catalytic converter. Now, the flashing check engine light usually will also log a diagnostic trouble code for what cylinder misfired. So let's say that you have a scan tool, a durametric. Everybody that owns one of these cars really needs a durametric. They really need to understand how to use it because it can save you a lot of money. It's a very simple tool to use and no more going to the shop and getting charged $130 for somebody to plug up a fancy computer to the car. Durametric will do a lot of things for these cars that shops do, okay? Shop owners may not agree with what I'm saying, but a lot of these people that own these cars need to learn more about how to use them themselves and work on them themselves. This is an enthusiast-based car these days. So a Durametric will tell you, okay, you have a P0300. That means you have multiple cylinder misfires on one or more cylinders. So a P0300 is a generic. A P0301 would be a cylinder misfire on cylinder one. A 306 is a misfire on cylinder six. So the last number in that diagnostic trouble code is the cylinder that is misfiring, except for on a PO300, which is all of them or more than one of them. So as the bore scoring continues on through the different stages, a lot of times you have the wear associated with the ferrous stand coating going away, the piston rings and all that. You have oil getting in the combustion chamber. You have an over rich fuel situation. Both of these can equate to a spark plug that gets heavily laden with stuff. It turns black, it gets a huge buildup of soot on it. That soot is oil and fuel mixed together and that will impede that spark plug from firing or maybe sometimes it slows it down from firing and it will fire late. A late firing spark plug a lot of times is what will create the resistance that makes the engine know, hey, I've logged a misfire. So usually you have to have oil consumption going on or you have to have heavily fuel laden cylinders to have an individual cylinder misfire or multiple cylinder misfire. But in advanced stages, especially with bore scoring, the cylinder misfires are pretty much a symptom that tells us we're advanced maybe to stage three or stage four bore scoring. Now you may have a diagnostic trouble code for catalyst efficiency or something to do with an aged O2 sensor or an aged catalytic converter. All of these can be tied back to a lot of times excess fuel enrichment or excess oil consumption or both and also just time in service and age. Uh, none of these cars are new anymore and they're all getting older pretty quick. So if you see catalyst efficiency codes a lot of times people will say, change the O2 sensor. Well, yeah, you can do that, but at the same time, you have to look at what caused that to go bad. Did it just time out? Is it just old? Or does it have something playing into it like excess oil consumption, excess fuel consumption, both of which are being burned and can create a situation that fouls out the O2 sensor or helps to clog up, if you will, the catalytic converter. So we see a lot of times the soot that comes from these engines in the tailpipes is caused by aging O2 sensors, aging catalytic converters, and the fuel trim and enrichment that comes from those two things helps to add into the bore scoring because excess fuel creates the solvent that kills the oil, that kills the ability of the oil to inhibit the wear, and then you have another recipe for bore scoring. So 
Catalyst efficiency codes, O2 sensor codes, sometimes can be tied into bore scoring. So it's always been a characteristic of the Porsche flat six engine to smoke a little bit at startup. That goes all the way back to the beginning of the Metzger six cylinder, goes all the way through the end with a 993, and it continued on with all these water-cooled cars. One reason is because the engine is horizontally opposed. Now with the older air-cooled engines, they were also dry sump. So you could have sometimes a pool of oil would, would come back from the oil tank, it would fill cylinders up, things like that. You know, those engines also had higher tension rings, and a lot of times if they were tracked, they would smoke at startup. These engines have a couple of things that play into that. One is the air oil separator. Air oil separators lead a lot of times to consumption and also to smoking at startup. So these particular engines have a dowel pin that is put in the second piston ring, if you can see this. And this dowel pin is located here to keep that second piston ring, which is responsible for 80% of the engine's oil control, okay? It keeps that particular piston ring so the gap at the end of the piston ring, which you see kind of right here, never ends up at the bottom of the cylinder. If that ends up at the bottom of the cylinder, it allows oil to come through. The next time you start the engine up, it's going to smoke like crazy, okay? So this particular dowel pin is put here to keep the piston ring on the second groove always at 90 degrees, just like this. It would never allow that ring gap to be down here. So that's one reason that the factory was able to employ some things to keep the engines from smoking, but it didn't solve it. So sometimes smoke at startup is normal for these engines, especially if you crank them up and you move them out of the garage, shut them off, crank them up again, very shortly thereafter, or maybe even a day after, they shortly ran for a minute or so, it's going to smoke like a freight train. Don't worry about that. That's normal, that's expected. But if you see that your consumption is going up and you see that your smoking is starting to increase at startup, you have to start putting that piece of puzzle together. That's when you want to probably carry out a little bit more diagnostics to try to figure out if you actually have some form of bore scoring going on or if maybe the engine is losing the air oil separator. So the M96 and M97 Porsche engine, the oil can tell you a lot. Debris that is in the oil will tell you a big picture about the condition of the engine. It, the, basically the engine oil, the sump, this area here, is pretty much the window to the sole of this engine. If you have debris in the sump, that usually is wear debris that is coming from something like a scored piston, like this, or a scored cylinder that we've been showing you. And a lot of times that debris helps to put the puzzle together that you do have some form of wear going on. Now remember in the first session of this video where Charles and Lake were talking about the size of particles. Remember, if you can see a particle, used oil analysis is a, going to be a very poor way of detecting that particular debris. It is for the microscopic stuff that we can't see with the human eye the stuff that has a micron count that is so small that we can't see it. It would either be microscopic or at least need a magnifying glass to see it. So if you pull the engine oil sump off during an invasive evaluation and you find very small pieces of debris that is non-ferrous, meaning it is not magnetic, it almost looks like aluminum oxide powder. If you see that, a lot of times that is the wear debris coming from this piston or it can also be the wear debris coming from this lock, lock sill cylinder, okay? So that little tiny stuff to me is more critical than big pieces. Big pieces are heavy, they stay in the sump, they don't go anywhere. This very small, very hard, heavily silicon laden wear debris is easily suspended in the oil and then the oil circulates it throughout the entire engine and it contaminates every internally lubricated component inside the engine. So a lot of times I have customers call me up and they say, well, it's not a big deal. The debris that I found in the oil, it's not any big stuff. You know, it's not like the engine's just coming apart. This is real tiny stuff. It really doesn't matter. And I have to say, sir, what you have to understand is that debris is the most harmful. It's the stuff that gets in the oil, sets in the oil, is suspended there, and then is circulated throughout the entire oil system and usually it kills the oil pump pretty quick. So any debris in the oil is too much and 
material from the cylinders, from the pistons, is certainly going to be abrasive to everything in the engine, pretty much due to the fact that it's aluminum and silicon combined. Now, if you find a grayish type of flat material in the oil, a lot of times that is the ferrostan. That is the actual piston skirt coating that has come off of the piston skirt. A lot of times it will have very small lines in it, and it will be ferrous. It's ferrostan. It will stick to a magnet, okay? So that debris is actually coming off the piston skirt. So the ferrostan is flat with a slight curve to it. It will usually pull up in the sump plate toward the back of it where there's a lot of kind of dead space. And you'll usually have four or five pieces of it together. And it can come off one piston or multiple pistons. If you find that debris, the slightly curved, somewhat flat, has lines in it, brown colored, kind of brownish gray colored, magnetic. If you find that in the oil, it is a dead ringer that you are losing the skirt coating, the ferrostan skirt coating on the pistons. There's nothing else in the engine that looks like that. It's not the cylinders it's wearing. At that point, you're losing the piston skirt coating, which is always an early onset characteristic of cylinder bore scoring. So in closing of this particular segment, I want to remind you that you can have one of these symptoms or all of these symptoms and end up having an engine with cylinder bore scoring. And a lot of times, of course, remember, we have different stages of this. So if you continue driving the car, you can expect that you're going to have more and more of the symptoms add up to collateral damage. At the end of the day, you want to avoid collateral damage. Collateral damage can take out the really critical components in the engine that are retained during a reconstruction process. So that being said, I want to thank you for joining us here on Renvision for another one of our cylinder bore scoring videos. We've got more to come. We're going to teach you what we know. <music>